Hi, Misha here, and also on behalf of Jay, who couldn't be here today, happy April 1st, April Fool's Day. In the past, for several years, we've done some, what we hope, fun videos for this very informal holiday, including shooting Jay with a Nerf gun, and uh, nearly going to the hospital over energy drinks, and we did have plans for this year. But we decided to put them on hold. The um, reasons are, you know, I had a personal thing, which I'm doing fine with. It's just a lot to take in and, you know, a lot to do. I've got a major gun deal coming up. And uh, Jay is dealing with some personal stuff too. Some good, some bad. Plus, with recent events in the firearms community over certain people and events... We couldn't think of anything to, to do a prank on that wouldn't get people outraged. Right now, it's just times are so sensitive. We just decided not to do it this year. Yet. Here's the deal. Sometime in 2021, there is going to be a surprise April Fool's video. Just not on April 1st. You have been warned. This is the only warning it could be next month. It could be on Christmas. But there's going to be something coming. And for this video, let's start off by talking about this gun. We actually took this to the range. And uh, recorded it a while back, but other things kept getting in the way. But now, this seems like a good time. This is a Chinese import C96 Mauser copy clone what have you broom handle but instead of firing six excuse me a 7.63 Mauser it fires 9 by 19 parabellum but more interesting it takes detaching magazines Chanel Fuhrer mags here's the compact 10 rounder And over here, set you down for a second, we have the big, beefy 20-rounder. And uh, I believe the major import run of these was by Navy Arms, under the name... TU-711, or Model 711. Kind of an interesting gun, even though it's technically a commercial gun. And it really has two different broom handle pedigrees coming together here. The 9mm chambering and the detaching magazine chambering, which is something that came about because of the select fire model 1932 the Schnellfuhrer also known as the model 712 that's kind of where the name 711 comes from is uh, semi-automatic 712 it was never official but it's been used by different companies over the years and it's as good as any so we'll talk about some of the mechanics the goods and the bads of these guns and we'll discover if these are actually safe to shoot. So let's finally get to it. Let's set our Chinese subject matter aside for just a bit and talk about 9mm broom handles. This one you've seen in a video or two. It has its own interesting story including why it has the shorter barrel. But for right now we'll talk about World War One. Here is a original uh, Kaiser era P08 Luger, which was the standard military sidearm during World War I. It was uh, supplemented by lots of 32 caliber guns from Walther, Mauser, and others, but this was the standard full caliber, and 
He was the first to fire 9mm Parabellum, and by 19 Luger, as we call it. But German arms factories could only make so many. This has, of course, a detaching 8-round mag. The military version here has the 3.9-inch barrel, although there were longer ones like the artillery and the naval Lugers. Fixed sights. And to supplement it, a contract was signed in 1916 for Mauser to produce about 150,000 C-96s Reworked to fire 9mm Luger. And this is often called the Prussian contract or the Red 9 contract. And uh, it was not the first time this gun was chambered for 9mm, at least a. Now, of course, the C96, the Construction 96 Mauser pistol, was quite arguably the first successful self loading pistol has this interesting grip. Actually, the earliest versions were not slotted for a shoulder stock, but this would appear pretty early on. It is a locked breech gun. We have an exposed hammer. Safety back here. I can do it. There we go. Interesting way of using the firing pin for disassembly, too. But to load it, you had to use stripper clips. I just grabbed one here. Let's see how it fits. Maybe if I can do it right. That's something I do too often. And it's a lot easier to do when there's rounds in it. But I didn't have any uh, dummy rounds. So was not going to try. 10 round clip, you load it, pull it out, and then your mag is still fixed here. You can remove the foreplate for cleaning, and of course when it was full, the bolt would go home, but I'm going to push it down, because it does have a hold open device, and you'd be good to go. Single action only, of course, because of when it was made. And so these fired the standard 9mm round. And originally they had a 5.5 inch barrel and an adjustable tangent rear sight from 50 to 500 yard, uh, meters. And they would burn a 9 into the grip panels so that you could easily differentiate the caliber from the initial 7 Point six three by 25 Mauser round. Now, actually, the first Mauser to be chambered for 9mm was the Model 1912. This was a commercial export offering, and it was chambered for a 9mm Mauser cartridge, which was essentially a necked up 7.63 by 25, becoming 9 by 25. And that's what happened with the Luger. As you know, the Luger, where did I put it? Started off as a 7.65 Parabellum. But Yorgi would quickly kind of neck it up to 9mm Parabellum. Well, seeing this as an opportunity, the Mauser Company did much the same with our gun here. But 7.63 would still remain the common standard. But these Red Nines would be delivered during the last couple of years of World War I. When the treaty came down, when the ceasefire happened in November 1918, the contract was nearly complete, about uh, 137,000 of the 150 originally ordered had been delivered. Unfortunately, after the war, the Treaty of Versailles put a lot of restrictions on a lot of things. And the Weimar Republic government banned civilian ownership of military-style guns. Sound familiar? So that's why the whole 1920 thing, it's uh, the Model 1920 Mauser rework kind of comes about. They took older guns and chopped the barrel down to 3.9 inches, 99 millimeter, 
and when they did this they removed the adjustable rear sight going to a Luger style fixed rear sight and oftentimes the shoulder stocks were destroyed and sometimes even the lug to take them was machined off and many were rebarreled from 9 millimeter to uh, uh, something 30 caliber either 7.63 or even 7.65 luger if that barrel was around again all things to comply with the treaty of versailles yes that rhymed and this is where we get the uh 1921 model which is known as the bolo it even had a smaller grip and Mauser would produce it throughout the 1920s, including many ending up with the Bolsheviks, hence the name. But then we get to 1930, and by this point, Germany no longer is all that strict about adhering to the Treaty of Versailles. They, they give it lip service, but they don't, in secret, really obey it. And this is where the next model comes from. And kind of where the story of the Schnell Fuhrer really begins. The original idea to do a select fire broom handle with attaching mags didn't actually start in Germany. See, in the 1920s, obviously, China was in a, a bad way. And it was about to get a lot worse with uh, Japan coming in. But there were various warlords, and they were buying various guns. And they were already impressed, already liked the initial, original C96. The 7.63 cartridge had great potential out of the 5.5 inch barrel. And the shoulder stock gave it better stability along with the adjustable sights. And this also kind of let them use them as de facto carbines or even um, later submachine guns because there were some restrictions on countries selling rifles to China, but not really pistols, so it was kind of skirting the law. But Germany in the 20s was, you know, under a lot of scrutiny itself. Therefore, Spain stepped in. The first Spanish select fire copies appeared in 1927, but the one that most people know came in 1928, that would be the Astra Model 900, which really was a select fire C96 attaching mag. And these were created primarily for the Chinese market and did very well. So much so that, uh, yeah, Germany got interested. Now, the model 1930 or M30 was still a 7.63 caliber gun, but it was the beginning in what this would be based on. The M30 would be streamlined for modern mass production with the technology of the 1930s. A lot had changed in manufacturing, and again, the C96 was a, I wouldn't say outdated, but a dated design. So they did streamline it, they eliminated some of the machining steps, simplified some of the parts manufacturing. But more importantly, they returned to the standard size grip versus the smaller bolo grip, and they kind of gave up on the short barrel and fixed sight arrangement. First they went back to a, well they went to a 5.2 inch barrel, but then they quickly went back to a 5.5 inch barrel, kind of interesting. Now most of these would still be in 7.63 Mauser, that just seems to have been the popular cartridge. By the way, yes, the Tokarev cartridge first adopted around this exact same time, 7.62 by 25 Tokarev, Tula Tokarev TT. Um, it was uh, basically just a, a, a magnum version of 7.63 mm. Now, don't at me in the comments. I know there are some differences, but I, you follow what I'm saying. And that's because uh, 7.63 Mauser, the little bottlenecked round, was very powerful for the 1920s. It wouldn't be surpassed until newer cartridges like the Tokarev or 357 Magnum would come along. Anyway, with the uh, M30 in hand, Mauser's next step was to work on a select fire version, again taking inspiration from Astra and others in Spain. And the first one would come out in 1931, the M31, and the design was uh, credited to uh, Josef Nickel. It was a select fire with a selector on the left side, 
it used detaching magazines and quickly a thousand were produced and sold to China to see how they did and the answer turned out to be not very damn well they were not reliable they had some parts breakage issues so much so that by 1932 the, the that model the nickel pattern was pulled out of production with only you know 35 to 4,000 built 3,500 to 4,000 built Luckily, though, another inventor there working, another designer, engineer at Mauser, named uh, Carl Westinger, a good uh, Carl, a good German name there, looked through the design and uh, really streamlined it, gave it, uh, reworked the auto seer, the selector, a few other little things. He tweaked it. It's kind of funny because this is where the Luger came from. It was a highly improved version of the C93 Borchard. This became the uh, model 1932, or M32, but it was more commonly known as the M172. And uh, it actually did use, this, oops, did use these types of mags, a 10-rounder to be in it, in the, in the holster, and then a 20-rounder was typically carried outside of the holster. So 30 rounds total for the gun. It had the selector on the side, and otherwise was uh, was pretty much the same. And uh, they they did uh, they did market this around. Most you find of the seven twelve model or in seven point six three, but Yugoslavia did trial some in nine millimeter out as well as seven point six three in the mid 1930s. So it's obvious that at least for testing purposes, Mauser did crank out some with nine millimeter barrels, nine millimeter uppers. But Yugoslavia didn't uh, didn't adopt it. Uh, they had some criticisms. One of uh, was it had a very high cyclic rate of about 900 RPM. So as a strict pistol, it was useless because of the shape of the gun. Although with its wooden stock slash holster, it actually uh, wasn't too crazy and controllable. And that's what this gun here is a uh, copy of that, uh, that gun there. And production would run roughly between 1932 and 1936 with at least new frames and guns being put together with existing parts through at least 1938. It seems like they turned out about 98,000 of the uh, of the Westinger pattern plus the original 4,000 of the nickel, meaning that total uh, Schnellfeuer production, Schnellfeuer basically the rapid fire gun, was just over 100,000. Although again, the nickel guns are not particularly good. But these actually seem to be at least the original German ones quite dependable, and they ended up completely taking over from their Spanish rivals. They had a few contracts here and there in Europe. Probably the biggest one in 1939, they did fulfill one for the German government who would order a small quantity, adopting it as the MP712. But this is just a, an interim measure, a stopgap measure until enough MP38s and of course later MP40s were available. But a few did end up in German service and therefore you can find select fire broom handles throughout World War II, just, you know, popping up here and there. But uh, the main production line was pretty much over before World War II began. You'd see some again assembled from existing parts, but it seems like they were uh, focusing on other things at this point in time. So in Europe, it didn't make a huge splash, but in China, that's a different story. Affectionately known as the box cannon, the uh, broom handle became very popular in China, and they bought a lot of them from Mauser, both semi-auto and select fire. Nearly, if not all, in 7.63 millimeter. In fact, more than half of the total run, probably quite a bit more than that, went to China in the uh, 712 production series. And they, they used it as a machine pistol. They really did. 
including it. They usually issued it with the two magazines and the shoulder stock. Now, because these are an 80s, 90s import, eh, putting a stock on one is uh, legally dubious, to say the least, even if they came with it. So I don't want to show you that. But I can show you this. Here's my Canadian Chinese contract high power. This is a number one Mark I. And this is original stock and gun. That's how much the Chinese liked it. When they made the, this contract for the stock, it's essentially the same stock as the Mauser, where the gun can go inside. And it's actually thanks to China that Canada started high power production at the John Inglis factory. And we've covered that story in a few different videos. But yeah, this um, this kind of supplemented the broom handle over there. And by the 1930s, with the Japanese en masse in China, they needed every gun they could get. And they did receive a good bit of aid from the Allies. Many nations used the uh, C96 and its variants, but it was so early in the life cycle of self-loading pistols that none adopted it and issued it as its primary standard gun. It was always kind of secondary, special forces perhaps, or for example the Italian Navy ordered just uh, some in 1899. That is except for China. China is the only nation of note that actually issued more broom handles than any other pistol to its military and police, at least for a time. And they had a lot of them. And you know what happens when China has anything and likes it. They copy it. And there are a whole host of different Chinese copies of guns, plus original German guns that China rebuilt. They even did them, of course, in 45. It's quite famous. So it is absolutely no surprise that we end up with a gun like this here. Like I said, this is the TU-1... Excuse me, this is the TU-711, the 711. And the name, Model 711, started being applied to importers, Milserp dealers, collectors in an in informal way to basically indicate something like a Schnellfuhrer, but in semi-automatic only. So essentially a, a detaching mag Mauser M30. So it's, it's not an official name, uh, 711, but people know what you mean. And that kind of explains why the, uh, the Chinese went with this. Now, there seems to have been a, maybe a couple of small import runs of these. that It gets a little murky. But the one of note is Navy Arms, who only brought over this model in 1992, according to their website. Now, whereas this gun started off as a 9mm, the Chinese here, they took 30 caliber bores, probably well-worn ones, and they bored them out to 9mm. This does mean that the wall is slightly thin on the barrel. It's slightly thicker here, but the main difference is at the chamber. This has more of a step. This is not stepped. It has a bit of a curve down, but far less, and that kind of shows you the barrel wall is thicker. That's because on these Chinese, the uppers and much of the internals are said to be original German parts, but these lowers here are Chinese, taking detaching mags. And you can tell they are machined, milled, but they lack some of the lightning cuts back here versus here. Of course, they have Chinese markings.
a little difference there. It also seems like the grip is ever so slightly larger, more bulbous than on the original German. This is just a little bit more spelt. Certainly the grip panels are different. These have much finer serrations. These are much coarser and obviously just kind of turned out on a machine with rougher finishing. And uh, yeah, so Chinese lower, this, and the detaching mags are actually either original or more likely probably, yeah, either original or replica, doesn't matter, but they are Schnaufier type mags, 20 and 10 rounds, and they would ship one of each with the pistol, and they would be serialized to the gun. But... Since this is firing 9mm, 9x19, not 30 caliber, 7.63x25, they actually installed a small block at the front there to make up for the difference in case length. China did something similar with their 9mm Tokarev pistols too. Kind of interesting. Also... Do you still have the cutouts on the top for chargers, as our British friends would say, or stripper clips? And it has your ramp adjustable rear sight. Kind of neat, I think. And it has a 5.5 inch full length barrel. And of course, this is a semi only, it never was a full auto Snellfuhrer lower. This modern Chinese lower is semi only, it never was full auto. There's no place for the selector. Here's one from the Schnellfuhrer. It would have gone on the side and toggled between semi and full auto modes but of course it would need extra holes and cutouts and everything else just like on an ak or an ar any other gun that has a selector but i just wanted to show you you could see the differences between the original schnaufuhrer or a copy of it versus the uh, semi-automatic approved lower frame here so is the 711 safe to shoot? Some say yes, and that they run reliably. Others say no and point to a few things. They point out that the Chinese metal used in the lower is substandard and soft. Of course, other people will counter that with uh, Chinese SKSs and Chinese AKs seem to be made of perfectly fine metal. They also point out the bored out, relined, redone barrel in the thinner wall, that's, that's valid. Although I haven't heard of a burst bar barrel on these. And finally, they point out the fact that these are assembled with some used German internals that have unknown wear on them, saying that some of these have broken apart and have the bolt coming back into the shooter's face. This is a common thing repeated. I don't know if there are any verified accounts online of it happening, but that's not to say it hasn't happened. With any old pistol, it's always a risk. So are they safe to shoot? Well, let's find out. We took it to the range, as I said at the beginning. Brumando, first shots. Jam on the end there. Mm-hmm. Or I'm off with Wolf. Could be kind of light loaded. Looks like it did a little bit of a feed thing, so. Yep. So a reasonably good start considering the ammo we were using. And we did bring a few different types of ammo out to try it with. So let's uh, load it up and we'll also use both magazines and see how it does. Now let's try the brim handle with Winchester. <laughs> did not like that. Alright, broom handle with Fiocchi. 
Funny enough, it seems to prefer the Wolf. Let me try it again. I don't think I pulled it. No, it's not chambered. Okay. Like it doesn't feel right. Okay. Let's try Wolf again. Yep. Oh, sure. oh well. With the 20, why not for fun? Just not getting the feet angle right. Oh well. So okay, so no problem with ignition, but we're having trouble cycling and getting all that down right. So, was it safe? Seemingly. Was it reliable? Not at all. But that is to be expected with old guns in the first place, especially trying to shoot modern ammunition out of something like this. That said, we have taken our uh, Canadian colleague out before and let it stretch its legs at the range. And it definitely did much better. High power! Huh? High power with extended mag. It did it a lot better than I expected for extended mag. <laughs> so this old 1940s high power works fine now. But it didn't always. When we actually first got this, we were having a few troubles with the trigger reset. Turns out it had a worn sear disconnector in there that we needed to kind of recut and redo. I think we might have also replaced a spring in it. So to be fair, that what you just saw was the second range trip with it. The first trip, yeah, we had this problem with the trigger not resetting fully and therefore it not working completely. It was cycling fine up top, but the problems were down on the lower. That's what happens with these old guns. Don't expect Glock or Beretta or modern SIG level of reliability. It, it kind of has troubleshooting, just kind of needs to be part of the fun of it. Also, surprise, surprise, a gun made in the 1940s or whatever does not work with a lot of modern ammunition types like hollow points or even fancier. So with that in mind, we can talk about maybe what's going wrong here with the... Uh, uh, 7 11. What a strange name. And the problem seems to be the recoil spring. It is best I know at the moment. It just feels crunchy. It doesn't feel smooth. I think I can show you here. This is where I really wish I had someone to help because it's hard to do this stuff on camera. Pulling it back, there's a little bit of, but not too bad on the grit. And it will go forward, because again, the bolt holds on the empty mag, so if I take the mag out, it will go forward with pretty good authority. But when I ease it back, there's not there's a little bit of there with the spring, and then it kind of hitches there a bit. Now, that's not terribly uncommon. It goes forward fine. It just does, isn't as smooth as I would... Uh, like, let me show you the other one over here. This is just a smoother gun. And part of that's probably just German and age. But I do believe a fresh recoil spring is in order. I think the previous owner kind of crimped it and bent it a bit. When I took it out, it looked a little, little bit wonky. So that'll probably be what I do. The magazine ejects fine. I don't know. I forgot I didn't have it in there. Goes up in there. Nice and smooth. Drops free. This one is a little bit stiffer, but it still locks in fine. And it kind of hangs down. Then it has this point. It's a little bit stiff there, but that's all right. You don't want to be dropping a valuable mag all the way on the ground. It certainly isn't catching on anything. The magazine springs seem adequate. They're not super strong. But then again, old pistol magazine springs were never particularly strong. 
I'm going to dry fire this for you once. I don't like dry firing guns. No problems there. Hammer cocks smoothly. Seems to have a good spring firing pin. Spring's fine. It's nice and stiff. Safety. A little bit of grit there. But fine. That'll block it from going forward. So, yeah, that would be my deal there. Is I do believe it is the spring. So much like with the uh, Canadian gun, that'll probably be what we'll do. Get a spring for this, put it in, and try it. So, are they safe to shoot? Well, I'm not a gunsmith, but... Honestly, the quality of the newer made lower doesn't concern me. China can machine steal. Is it potential that some of them out there are bad? Sure, but that's just kind of Chinese for you. The board out barrel, I'd prefer to be an original 9mm from the get-go, but there are thousands upon thousands of these in the country that China sent over board out from 30 cal to 9 mil and I haven't heard of any real issues I think your biggest problem would just be kind of poor accuracy but it doesn't seem to be a safety thing again not a gunsmith this is not gunsmithing advice the parts that would worry me the most would be the used German parts if any in the upper of your gun you just don't know the lifespan, how they've been treated, what they've been through, of course, and how well they're working. And again, that goes for any old gun. I would feel just as skeptical about this one. These guns have had long lives. The parts have been used. We don't know how much. And the problem with a lot of the stuff from China, when the original guns were used over there, it's very likely that many of them were shot with 7.62 Tokara of ammunition because it will fit, chamber, and fire, and even cycle in these guns. The problem is, this is a late 19th century locking system. It was never meant to handle something as powerful as the Tokara round. So firing Tokara through any of these guns, if you have one in the original chambering, will will wear parts out much quicker, much faster. Not a good idea. I never forget years ago in a gun shop and a family member bought a Chinese Tokarev 30 cal and the shop owner sold him Tokarev ammo. And the shop owner I know and trust. He sincerely thought there was no problem. It fit, it fired. But it's kind of like shooting plus P through a modern 9mm, excuse me, through a 9mm modern plus B, through a gun from the 1950s that just wasn't meant for it. You're not going to probably have wear and tear immediately, but over time, there are going to be issues. So, yeah, some uh, final thoughts on this gun. You know how I feel about Chinese guns. Let's end by surrounding this gun with its Chinese compatriots. This is my Type 54 that I picked up last year. I'm kind of excited about these imports. And this is one of my Chinese SKSs. I have a couple. Chinese guns are not guns that I typically seek out and want with a burning passion and desire. But they are interesting. So when an interesting one comes my way, and the price is all right, I'll pick it up. And that's what happened here with this kind of faux Schnellfuhr. I think the original design, the, the 7, 712, is interesting because it was a not the first submachine gun type, but it was kind of one of the first like PDW machine pistol styles, kind of like the later Scorpion VZ-61 or... Uh, Circle 11 Radom 
PM63 rack. Small compact gun with optional stock. 10 20 round mags. I think it started something, and it's funny because it was totally inadvertent. This gun came to be, at least the original, because of rules against Weimar Germany, conflicts in China, and rules against sending rifles to China, and uh, blatant copyright patent infringement in Spain. But it all ended before World War II in Germany, in Europe. But it was continued on in China, in Asia, for decades. In fact, some of these showed up in Vietnam. The Japanese also acquired a number of broom handle Mausers, especially Japanese operating in the mainland of uh, China. So even though China went to guns like the Tokarev and even later the Makarov, they always had kind of a sneaking admiration for the good old box cannon. And, you know, Chinese ingenuity. They had some parts, they had some guns, they put them together, and they sold them over here to Americans. And I think it represents something kind of interesting just for that, if nothing else. So, would I buy one as a shooter? No, I don't think these will ever be reliable, and they're definitely not a gun I would put thousands of rounds through, period. But would I be 100% afraid to shoot it? No. As long as things like the, the bolt stop, the locking block are in good shape, I'd be reasonably comfortable, as much as I would be with any older surplus gun like an SKS or Mose at any rate. But primarily, I would pick it up if you found one for a good price, just as a curiosity, just as something different, because we don't get Chinese guns anymore, at least not rifled barrel. We can still get shotguns, but these will never come around again. And there are not very many in the country. I don't know how many came in, but if they only came in for one year, it's probably not a huge number. They pop up from time to time, so there's a few thousand maybe, but no more than that. And again, we, we shot this last year. It's been in kind of the back burner, and this video wasn't primarily on the German C96. It was obviously kind of geared towards the Snellfuhrer and the Chinese. I'm sure we'll cover the German and the 30 caliber in a different video at a different time. But uh, this is one we just needed to do, and I hope you found this kind of an interesting background. I really was surprised that there weren't any videos that I could readily come across on YouTube for the TU-711, uh, the Navy Arms Model 711. This kind of seems an odd oversight, considering how much people like Chinese guns these days, and how popular the broom handle Mauser is. Well, if you have any questions, or if you own one of these, we'd love to hear your feedback in the comments. As always, if you could, like, share, and subscribe. And if you'd like to help support the channel, please check out the link to our Patreon page. I feel like I'm forgetting something. Hmm. Hmm. Oh yes, the second part of the title. My thoughts and opinions on the Military Arms Channel, Mac, Tim Harmson, FEG, HD, 18, Dragonov. You been clickbaited, bitch. So yeah, we're gonna be trying these out for this season, you know, and uh, seeing how they do. And, uh, oh God, oh, <coughs> this is Misha, and we'll catch you next time. <coughs>